welcome and thank you for standing by. Currently, participants are on listen only for the presentation. At the time of the question and answer session, to ask questions on the phone line, please press star then 1. You'll be prompted to record your name so we introduce your question. Today's call is being recorded. If anyone objects, they may disconnect. I'd like to turn the conference over to Margaret Farrell. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Margaret Farrell, and on behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I'd like to welcome everyone to our November NCI webinar on advanced topics for implementation science research. We are very, very pleased to be able to um, present this follow-up on the sixth NIH meeting on dissemination and implementation research on health and further and continue the important discussion on reporting guidelines, measures, and harmonization. Before I turn the call over to our panel of speakers, I just want to go over a few session logistics. We encourage your questions on the webinar today. Um, there are two ways to submit your questions. You can press star 1 on your phone to ask your question live over the phone, and um, we'll be doing this after the speakers speak. Or at any point, you can type your question into the Q&A tab at the top of your screen, and then hit Ask to submit. Um, again, our speakers will be speaking for about the first half hour, and then we're lo really looking forward to a vibrant discussion to follow up. So um, please consider to, um, to join the conversation in whatever way you would prefer. I'm very, very happy to turn the call over now to Dr. Ross Brownson from um, Washington University in St. Louis, who's going to um, convene our call today. Dr. Brownson? Yes, thanks, Margaret. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining, and, and uh, I'll go ahead and advance to our team. We're going to start off with, with me presenting, and I'll present sort of the setup for the session today. And then Chris Carpenter is here, and he'll present on the uh, reporting part of it. And then Barshika Rabin is in Denver, and she'll present on uh, some of the measurement and evaluation issues that we discussed in the meeting. And each of us will also discuss some follow-up and some next steps, and then we're going to open it up for your questions. So the, the meeting we held back in October, um, we had this excellent core team of, of the three of us presenting here today, also Russ Glasgow, um, formerly at the NCI and now at the University of Colorado Medical School, and Guy Lanetta, who's at the NCI. And um, we wanted to present today um, a, an overview and some of the highlights and some of the next steps from the meetings that, that, that happened back in October. As a setup for this, I wanted to review, and many of you on the phone would have attended the previous meetings, um, the growth of dissemination and implementation research at, at the NIH has really been uh, quite remarkable. Over the past five meetings, when the, when the DNI uh, meetings began, a group uh, fourfold from 300 in the first meetings to more than 1,200, and, and I think the last few meetings were turning people away because the capacity couldn't keep up. Um, this year um, decided to do something different and take some of the some of the smaller pieces of this and break it up into some smaller meetings and so I'll show you in a minute what some of these meetings covered. Um, these were some themes that had been covered in previous meetings and there's some of the some of the issues that we thought were really important for the field um, and also this this time around there were some some funding some travel and meeting restrictions that made it difficult to uh, to have a, a large meeting, and if, if it's possible, we can perhaps follow up at the end about about the future planning for the larger meeting. Um, there is some hope that that can come back around, I think. So the setup for this smaller group of meetings um, was around three broad themes, or maybe four broad themes, depending on how you how you frame out the last one here. The first meeting was held on training and sort of what's going on in training, what's some of the needs in training, and where training for DNI research needs to be going forward. And there's some follow-up work on that going on, and, and perhaps that can be the focus for a future webinar like this. The research design meeting was originally a victim of the uh, government shutdown, so obviously it didn't happen because it was at the, at the, the tail end of the shutdown. Um, but I understand now that that's been rescheduled for January 9th and 10th of 2014. And that's going to, I think, do a sort of a survey of the landscape in DNI research and designs, bring design issues up, experts in different parts of design, 
and then talk about what, where the field is and what it needs to do going forward. The meeting we're talking about today is around uh, measurement and reporting, and, uh, and, there, and there's two somewhat separate, but also I think you'll see today on the webinar, uh, inter interconnected concepts. The, um, the concepts around the guidelines and measurement and evaluation, I just put up here a few of the sample questions that we were trying to address in our meeting back in October. Um, how, how well do the guidelines that are out there already exist and, and support DNI research? And Chris will have more to say about that. What domains are underdeveloped or lacking? How would we go to measurement and evaluation? Which measurements are well developed? What's the state of the art in measures and de measurement development? And where does the field need to go? Are, are measures harmonized? Are they cataloged well? Can you find a measure if you need a measure? And then the role of mixed measures and evaluation and measurement, which I think will also link over to the designs meeting that is, that is coming up in January. I won't spend time going through all of our experts, um, but I've got several slides here that cover the experts, and you'll see most people were housed in universities or in some of the federal agencies. Um, we're probably a little, well, actually, we are more U.S.-centric by far, and we would, we'd have liked to have sort of branched out across the globe a little more, but that gets to be a larger meeting, also gets to be um, more expensive and, and, and sort of difficult logistics. We did have a couple of representatives from, from Canada, um, Jeremy Grimshaw, um, represented uh, the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. And you see here um, a further set of, of, of collaborators across different agencies. We had people working in different settings, people who have different expertise, who come from many different disciplines. And so we tried to get a, a well-rounded group and also a mix of more uh, senior scholars and some more sort of mid to junior scholars so that we had diversity among the group. And I'll show you here the last group, the last set. Um, and you can see we had a quite a, quite a well-established and esteemed group, and we had really an outstanding meeting. The meeting was set up to be very interactive. We didn't have a lot of long lectures. We had a lot of interactive time. The last little piece I want to present is what we're calling, we've, we've gone around with a lot of different names. We call it a logic model or a framework or a template. But the idea behind this was to, to give us a start. And so we started, our planning group started and developed an initial, I'll call this the template. Um, and then we used the meeting as a chance to sort of fill in some of the things. So if you look across the, the top four broad domains, you see these broad categories of planning, delivery, evaluation results and reporting, and then long-term outcomes. And then you see a whole set of what I'll call the elements down below and that's sort of how you would populate these, these various domains. And so some of these are well established. We've got a, a good set of, of sort of reporting criteria, for example, describing what the intervention is or the evidence base. You can, you can find that in other guidelines. But then when it gets to things like context, you see some of these that are either have a single star or a double star. And context is one where really there's a lot of the reporting, even what context is, and then specifically what ought to be reported and measured around context that has not been well covered and it really is lacking a lot of the literature, at least in our opinion and in the opinion of the, uh, of the expert panel. We're going to play this out in a way in terms of what really is lacking, and you'll understand that in a minute when Chris presents on, on some of the review activities that we have planned. The, the, the domains here and the elements within us will obviously help us think about what could and should be reported, what needs to be measured, and where we have sufficient measurement properties and, and sort of the tools out there for people to be able to find these and use these. And so this is our initial start. If you'll, if you'll keep this in mind as we go through, this may be a slide we'll refer back to in the discussion part of our of our, of our webinar today, but we, and, and the, the group really did have a lot to say about this, this framework and helped us to, to get it, I think, to sort of the second generation, and we'll be, we'll be furthering this, working on it, and then, and then writing about this as we go forward. And so that's, that's it for my part of this. Um, so this is the setup, and next we're going to hear from Chris Carpenter, who will tell us about uh, some of the work that we've done and where we're going uh, moving forward related to reporting guidelines. Thank you, Ross. Uh, I want to 
briefly discuss the road to uh, develop dissemination and implementation reporting guidelines with the specific objective to try to describe what are reporting guidelines, give some examples of what already exists across the uh, medical and healthcare literature landscape, and describe a rationale for developing specific DNI reporting guidelines. Um, I want to review existing guidelines that, that might be of relevance to the DNI field, and then to describe the steps that we came to after our meeting last month uh, to develop DNI reporting guidelines. And there is some overlap with um, what Borsica is doing that's going to be pretty significant, and we definitely need the input of, of the audience on this webinar to help us to fill out this picture. For those that aren't familiar, um, the Equator Group grew out of a response to concerns about the quality of research reporting in general. Their first organized meeting was in uh, 2008, which was um, 12 years after the first reporting guideline came out, the consort guidelines in 1996. Um, the consort guidelines, for those that aren't familiar with them, are for randomized control trials. And after that, uh, a avalanche of reporting guidelines began to form, including the MOOSE guidelines in 2000 for meta-analysis of observational trials, the STAR guidelines for diagnostic studies. And despite early data demonstrating improvements in post-guideline research reporting in journals that advocated the use of these publication guidelines, dissemination and widespread use of these uh, publishing guidelines was slow to evolve hence the birth of the Equator Network. The Equator Group was formed, as I said, in 2008 to assist in the development, dissemination, and implementation of robust reporting guidelines. I spoke a moment ago about the evidence in support of these, and although the evidence is thus far fairly weak, remember that the Equator Group just came about in 2008, and one of their missions is to show that these reporting guidelines actually do improve the quality of research reporting. This is a sampling of the literature that exists so far, and uniformly it's been shown to increase the overall quality of reporting as judged by uh, the number of uh, checklist items that are completed by authors of these reporting guidelines, and if nothing else, it standardizes the approach to writing these research reports and for the peer reviewers how to analyze these reports. Unfortunately, the penetration of these reporting guidelines into various medical field journals has been rather slow and incomplete. Therefore, one of the objectives of the Equator Network is to raise awareness that these guidelines exist, to become a global leader for publication guidelines as both a central repository and a source of education and training, also to assist in the development and dissemination of publication guidelines, and we've taken full use of that as we develop these DNI guidelines for our purposes. They also want to monitor the status of quality of reporting through both the original research and monitoring what journals and other specialties are doing to look at reporting guidelines and to look at the conduct of research into quality of reporting. As people on this call, I'm certain know, DNI research is quite more, uh, a bit more complex than the traditional medical trial, evaluating the efficacy of an intervention or a diagnostic accuracy of a test. DNI research includes an outer context that includes the strength of evidence, awareness of evidence, applicability to one setting, educational st streams, and opinion leaders, as well as a, uh, internal evaluation of the um, uh, of the setting in which you want to apply the evidence. Quite a bit more complex than a, a typical trial, which tries to hold everything standard except for the intervention. And the, the research report guidelines that have been propagated thus far really deal with that much more simple traditional research landscape. As an example of the complexity of DNI research, uh, one core component is assessing uh, the, the, the difference between pragmatic and explanatory continuum. And an example that was uh, generated in the recent years is the PRECIS tool, P-R-E-C-I-S, which stands for the Pragmatic Explanatory Continuum Indicator Summary. It was introduced in 2009 to assess and display the position of individual trials, the trials that form the basis of DNI interventions, within the Pragmatic Explanatory Continuum. As depicted here, it assesses 10 domains, which are ideally rated by trialists devising DNI studies, with more explanatory trials near the hub and more pragmatic trials further from the hub. Note that a revised PRESI's instrument is expected in 2014, but looking through all of the existing publication guidelines uh, of various trial designs, none of them specify an assessment of pragmatic versus explanatory using the PRESI's tool or any other measure. So that's one example of a layer of complexity of DNI research that the current publication guidelines miss. As Ross was saying, we developed this uh, framework uh, for our conference in Washington, D.C. last month. And one thing that we noted uh, in each of these domains 
was that some of the elements that we felt were essential to report uh, in DNI research would be rather difficult to collect. We're not really sure what the measures are that we would ask researchers in DNI research to look at, how to measure it, how to report it, um, or how to assess the quality of that uh, data collection and reporting. And that is a real challenge. We also recognized at our DNI conference that there's all, already uh, over 30 publication guidelines that have been propagated. And some of the guidelines, like the CONSORT guideline that was first published in, two, in 1996 and then was updated in 2010, have multiplied. So there are multiple subsets of these guidelines. Uh, the CONSORT guideline now has a separate CONSORT for acupuncture research, patient-reported outcomes, non-pharmacologic research, herbal interventions, harms, cluster randomized trials, non-inferiority trials, and pragmatic trials, and there's two more that are in development right now. And we recognize that there is a definite risk of publication guideline fatigue. Um, so one of the key questions that we have addressed is, do we want to develop yet another publication guideline for DNI research, or alternatively, should DNI guidelines um, be advocated in the existing guidelines and, and put the principles of DNI research into um, the different consort statements, the start statements, and wherever applicable. So at our meeting, after getting the, the expert consensus of everybody there, we devised a five-step process to how to proceed in developing DNI guidelines if indeed this is worthy of pursuing. And each of the steps really is going to determine whether the next step is necessary. Step one was to identify existing and development guidelines relevant to DNA research. We've made some progress on that step, and I'll review those in just a moment. Step two is to contact author groups of each guideline uh, to parallel efforts. That is, who's working on similar projects, and there are a few author groups around the world that are also developing similar ideas, although there isn't exact 100% overlap. Step three is to analyze the elements and recommendations of existing guidelines to establish DNI inconsistencies or deficiencies relative to our framework. Step four is to assess the value of publishing systematic review of steps one through three and an optimal approach to improving their standardized and DNI research conduct and reporting. And for that, there are probably two different uh, ways to proceed depending on what we find in steps one through three. Option number one would be to produce a separate concert like DNI publication guideline that doesn't currently exist and which would become part of the equator network. Option number two would be to incorporate DNI components into existing guidelines, which might be uh, preferable from a publication guideline overload standpoint, but would certainly be challenging since there's different groups that are um, authoring each of these, these guidelines. So what progress have we made? Uh, in step one, I said that we were trying to identify existing and development guidelines relevant to DNI research. Here's our five guidelines thus far that we have developed that probably have applicability to what we're trying to do, including an assessment of the quality of reporting of complex healthcare interventions, one of the consort um, extensions that I talked about for cluster randomized control trials, a systematic review extension, the Prisma Equity extension for guidelines, uh, reporting guidelines for systematic reviews with the focus on health equity, another extension of the consort statement for non-pharmacologic intervention randomized control trials, and the SWIRE project, which is uh, standards for reporting quality improvement projects. In addition, there are three guidelines that are in development uh, that the Equator Group network, network includes on their website. One is a consort extension for social and psychological interventions. Another is by a British group developing standards for reporting phase four implementation studies called STAR-I. And the last is reporting manualized interventions for dissemination and, uh, and evaluation, the REMIND statement. These are what we have identified so far. There probably are more out there, and part of our systematic process is going to be to contact the authors of these individual guidelines to see what else they are aware of and to use the Equator Network's extensive network to figure out what else is out there that we've not yet discovered. We also are going to um, assess the overlap of these efforts with our ideas by formally assessing and publishing uh, DNI domains. The, the exact methods of, of how to qualitatively assess overlap is still being devised, um, but early reviews suggest that many aspects of our proposed framework are missing from existing guidelines, including things like the Pressies instrument that we just presented, um, the assessing adaptation and evolvability of DNI interventions. So early on, it looks like some of these guidelines have holes that we can fill. We've got a network of collaborators now that are working hard to, to move this forward, and we do expect to make progress in the coming months. 
And at this point, I'll turn it over to Forsaker Rabin, who's going to talk about some of the measurement uh, instruments that we're, we're going to need as we develop the DNI publication guidelines and uh, the, the science and challenges there. Thank you, Chris and Ross. Um, this is Borsha Karabin. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to talk about another topic that was a uh, main topic for our meeting, and it's measurement and evaluation challenges and opportunities for DNI research and uh, practice. I am. There are a number of reasons why measurement and evaluation are so crucial to dissemination and implementation, science and practice. And if you want to list a few, one would be that we want to understand why certain implementation efforts succeed and fail. Also related to this, we also want to learn about which DNI strategies work in what context. And uh, it is important for us to understand how well we are progressing toward national and local goals. Measurement and evaluation for DNI can answer these questions and many others that might be important for um, this field. So truly the question is not whether measurement should happen, but rather what, when, how, and with what frequency we want to measure. And so we would like to think about these concepts as we move through a number of challenges I will present to you in the coming slides. So the first major challenge is terminology for dissemination and implementation. Because dissemination and implementation in the context of health is such a relatively new field, there is still a lot of inconsistency and variation in how we use terminology and how we classify different constructs and terms. So if we want to move forward with measurement and reporting, we will need to map and better understand how people are using different terms. And ideally, we will want to harmonize the usage of these terms across areas and geographical regions. There have been some improvements and uh, advancements in these areas. Um, I have listed um, a couple of resources that you can use for um, terminology in DNI, and there are some other efforts, but there needs to be more work done. The second challenge that I want to talk about is the importance of identifying critically important constructs for DNI. There, is, uh, there are a number of constructs that Chris also pointed you to, uh, in the inside uh, context and the outside context and within that specific element. But we are still not completely sure which factors are most important for DNI. And as we know, the devil is in the details. If we provide different meanings, operation, operationalizations, measures for the same concept, confusion might increase. There have been some improvement in these areas as well. Uh, Rachel Tabak and colleagues at WashU in St. Louis cataloged and classified existing dissemination and implementation models, and uh, that can be a great resource, a starting point for those who are looking for appropriate frameworks. There are also some commonalities across studies and models in terms of areas of importance. Context, broad outcome and process measures seem to be very important in DNI research. And um, also uh, Dr. Proctor and colleagues identified a set of implementation process outcomes that serve the basis for a number of additional work. And uh, I am going to talk a little bit about the CERC group in a moment. They also identified a number of constructs through the interest of their stakeholders, and those are listed on this slide. And uh, um, as you can see, acceptability, adoption, organizational, um, readiness to change or individual readiness to change, barriers and facilitators are seem to be important areas where measures and consultation around measures are needed. So linking back to our template, DNI template, obviously there are certain areas, as uh, both Ross and uh, Chris uh, suggested, where we already developed some measures and they are not frequently used. So if you look at the uh, um, one asterisk uh, concept, including the pragmatic criteria or adoption, those are areas where we do have measures, we do have some concepts around reporting, but we don't use them very frequently. Other areas, we still have to work on creating appropriate measures, and those areas seem to be sustainability, transportability, also measurement of the multi-level context, and generally context as it shows up in multiple of these sub-constructs. Uh, 
So um, in the future, we would like to work with um, a larger group of people thinking about how to make existing measures more used and develop new measures for areas where we don't have appropriate ones. Another challenge and also opportunity, obviously, is uh, the need to catalog and assess and harmonize existing DNI measures. We do need to understand what measures we have already and create some metadata on them, meaning of their characteristics and uh, in what context they work. Other areas seem to have a better agreement about measurement, and uh, it seems to be um, important to work with similar measures, and that's what we mean by harmonization, so that we can compare results from studies and further the accumulation of knowledge in the field of DNI. There are a number of ongoing efforts we were able to identify through our meeting, but this is one area where we would really appreciate additional input. Are there other resources that attempt to do this cataloging and assessing of measures? The ones that I will highlight today are the CERC Instrument Review Project and the GEM DNI Initiative. There are a couple of other projects I listed here that are similar or connected to uh, the DNI field, perhaps a little bit more broadly than um, uh, we will discuss today. And then there are some common findings in terms of these resources and what they found when they tried to bring together measures. One is that psychometric knowledge is often missing and partial for the existing measures. There are not really good standard or best practices for the development of new instruments and what should go into that process. And then finally, Existing measures are often not practical or feasible or actionable, and I will talk a little bit more about that as well. So this is just a little bit more information on two ongoing efforts to bring or synthesize knowledge about DNI measures and also start the harmonization of the measure use. The first one is done by the Seattle Implementation Research Collaborative, and this is their instrument review project. They use a systematic review approach to identify instruments to date, they have identified 450 DNI-related instruments, and there will be three uh, primary outcomes from their project. One will be a comprehensive library of DNI instruments. Another one is a rating system that makes it possible to evaluate existing measures, and the rating of these measures using these rating systems are ongoing. And finally, they are planning on um, starting some sort of consensus process around the measures or instruments. If you want to learn more about their work, I provided the website here. The other effort that we are aware of is um, using the National Cancer Institute grid-enabled measures, DNI uh, platform, and this is a crowdsourcing approach where people are, uh, users are commenting and rating measures and using this approach to identify the most uh, favorable measures. This um, interface has currently 130 implementation science measures across 74 constructs, and they are also, um, most of them or some of them are rated for a gold standard uh, quality or the traditional evaluation effort and also practicality. And I will show you what the difference between those two rating scales are. This is just a screenshot of the two initiatives for you to recognize it easier when you visit them. And then I am moving to the fourth challenge, and this idea is around qualitative measurement and the idea of, especially in dissemination and implementation science, qualitative information seems to matter at least as much as quantitative data. However, we don't have standardized guidance on how to assess qualitative instruments. At least we couldn't find any. Um, the use of common instruments across studies for qualitative data collection is even more challenging than it is for quantitative measures. And we also have to think about, especially with DNI and real-world application, the use of observational approaches and unobtrusive approaches that um, make it possible to actually collect the appropriate data. There are some guidance and examples of how we can integrate qualitative data with quantitative data. One is um, many of you will be familiar with the um, best practices for mixed methods research. And then the other one is an ongoing study, the My Own Health Record Project, and there are some publications from this study, so you might want to check those out. Finally, the last challenge, and perhaps the most unique to DNI, is this idea that we want to uh, balance 
the traditional gold standard evaluation criteria with the criteria for practicality and feasibility. So basically the idea that we, if we want to use these measures in the real world, then um, we need to think about how actionable they are, how well they can be implemented in the real world setting in terms of length and the way and obtrusiveness, as I mentioned earlier. There are some, there is some guidance in terms of how to think about measures with these different criteria in mind. I will show you this um, feasibility criteria that we used in the GEM DNI project. There are some papers out there, including the one by Glasgow and Riley on practical measures. And there were some other attempts uh, to create brief measures, um, again, using the JAM or the CTC, CTSA DNI measures effort by Jonathan Tobin. Um, and this is just to contrast how we can compare gold standard measures for rating and practical measures for rating. And we highlighted in red the areas that might be unique or different from what you think. So one would be thinking about sensitivity to change. The other one to think about the brief uh, nature of the uh, tool or the easy administration of a given instrument, so feasibility, how important the concepts that we are measuring are to stakeholders, and how actionable are the, is the information that we provide through this measurement. These are some questions that we discussed as a starting point for our meeting, and uh, since Russ already listed them, I will not go through them again. And um, here are some next steps for DNI measurement. Part of these our group decided to undertake, um, including um, identifying and describing ongoing efforts and resources for DNI measures and harmonization and evaluation. Uh, we would like to learn more about how to guide users in the identification of the appropriate DNI models and link them to the appropriate constructs and measures. We would like to dis have discussion about development of new measures for critical DNI areas and to identify or develop a set of practical brief measures that have strong internal validity. Finally, we talked about the development of a rapid instrument development process and um, thinking about standards for qualitative instrument development and harmonization. So the way you could best help this part of the project is really, first of all, um, going through all those questions. If you have ongoing work, please tell us. But more um, immediately, if you are familiar with other tools or web resources that attempt to synthesize and measure, um, synthesize measures and evaluate them uh, for DNI, please contact me, let me know, because we would like to include those in our current work. And I'm going to let uh, Ross take this back, I think. Okay, so I think um, that's the formal part of our presentations. And uh, so now we have Borska, Chris, and Ross, along with Bila and Russ, are going to be on the line. And so, um, Margaret, you can help me figure out how best to manage the questions, but this is the question and answer time. So please uh, get ready with your questions. Um, we will ask the yeah, so we will. I don't. We don't have anything specific, but but the one thing we'll do is when you ask a question, if you can try to keep it as brief and concise as possible, and we'll do our best to do the same on this end. Margaret, anything else in terms of managing the question and answer? No, that's great, Ross. Thank you. I just want to um, remind everyone that in order to type a question, if you would press star one to be connected um, over the telephone, or you can use the Q and A tab at the top of the screen. Um, Gil, I think you had a question queued up. Uh, no, the one that was the last one, I guess. Um, we had a first question from, um, from, from Russ Glasgow asking that um, if each presenter had to name only one or two things that was most important now to do to improve DNI, what would that be? And maybe Borska will start with you. I would be happy to. So I think that uh, I would just mention one to keep it easy, and it is to identify a subset of measures that could be used across projects that is practical, actionable, and uh, appropriate for multiple contexts and for multiple stakeholders. 
I think that that would uh, really improve our opportunity to generate outcomes that can be compared across studies. Great. Uh, Margaret, I'll, I'll chime in. I think a couple things we could do. I think one would be in light of that we don't yet have a set of DNI reporting guidelines that's sort of a standalone set, is to take those parts of other guidelines that are already out there that Chris mentioned and, and use those parts. And I would particularly, although it's not a guideline per se, um, the work that, that uh, Russ Glasgow and Larry Green did on reporting external validity, including a checklist for, for reporting external validity, that would go a long way, and, and I know in terms of our, our work in physical activity, many of those measures are missing, and I think that I think that's another step. And then a simple one, uh, when you have an instrument or a measure, um, use the crowdsourcing approach on GEM and, and report it to GEM so that the rest of the world will know about it. Yeah, Russ, I agree. We need to really look at the guidelines that already exist with the, with the fine-tooth comb and, and within the, the lens of DNI research, figure out what they are currently measuring that applies to our DNI research, and more importantly, what they're not measuring, uh, and make sure that each of the groups is aware that there is a science, implementation science method, and there are ways to measure some of these phenomena, and those that we can't measure doesn't mean they're not important. Uh, so we really need to link up these various groups around the world that are developing publication guidelines and make sure that the, the DNI message is heard. Great. Great. Thank you. We have a question um, in from Justin Starr and who asks, um, it appears that the DNI community defines implementation very differently from the IT and informatics communities. And then um, Justin asks, what are your definition of implementation, and how does that relate to implementing a piece of software in a clinical environment? Boy, I'll, I'll, I don't know if I could take on the, the sort of the software IT linkage because I'm not exactly sure exactly how they would how they would look at it. But I think for for us, it's you know for implementation in in the DNI world, it's really the you know measuring the sort of a little bit more at the micro level, you know, within a specific setting, measuring the uptake of, a, of an evidence-based intervention. You know, the, the NIH version of DNI is often framed around some evidence-based practice, a policy, a clinical practice, a treatment of some kind, and what will, what will enable that uptake within a specific setting to, to take, take place. And so that's how that's how the NIH would look at it, I think. Um, how it relates to IT, informatics, software development, I'm not completely sure, um, although I'm, I'm sure that those fields probably take a little bit better use of a, a user interface or maybe better marketing research with potential users of a piece of software, but I'll see if, if any of our other presenters have a better answer to the second part. The IT world is not my world, and I certainly don't know how to compare the definitions across the, the medical fields and the IT world. What I will say is our original idea to, vote, to develop DNI publication guidelines included a section specifying definitions for each of these entities. And I think that having clear-cut definitions in, in one publication guideline manuscript would go a long ways to making sure that we're all on the same page when we describe these attributes. I think I, the only thing I wanted to add is Linking back to my, the first challenge I mentioned around terminology, and that there is still need, work need to be done around bringing together these different definitions. We kind of thought that implementation is pretty much close to be defined, but clearly there are other things that we should consider. Um, I'm not sure if this, this is Gilanetta um, from the NCI. I'm not sure if this um, is really correct, but trying to address Justin's question, I think, um, that, for example, some app development, some app development or, um, you know, health communication issues, I think that those can be important implementation science questions when you're thinking about how to get physicians to change behavior and implementing um, practice guidelines and studying how different uh, communication interventions um, may be adopted or not adopted and what are the aspects involved in that. Um, a great example of that is with the new HPV screening guidelines um, and using this new principle, equal management at equal risk, now they've developed um, risk estimates 
and now there can be an implementation, we're working on an implementation study to look at how um, using those, using information on risk may change physician behavior in terms of um, recommendations for the intervals with which women get tested. Um, so that's a way of doing implementation science and using IT. I don't know if that really addresses the question, but that's the first thing that came to my mind as an example. And, and Justin, please feel free, you know, anyone to, um, to continue to ask your questions by using the Q&A tab at the top of the screen, or you can um, ask your question live by pressing star 1. Um, I, I was interested in, in moving um, the DNI conference from, from a large conference into the, the three working group meetings. Um, what the presenters thought in terms of um, surprises or maybe um, new things that happen because of the changing dynamics of the meeting. Um, was there anything that came up at the meeting that you weren't expecting um, that you're excited to be moving forward on? Well, a couple things I thought from the meeting, I like the reflections of any of the others who were who were leading our core group. Um, I, I was, I mean, I think that the advantage over the smaller meeting was very interactive. We had even the large group was still a relatively small group, so we could have very, um, very thoughtful and interactive conversations. That of course is is tough to do with over a thousand people. It's a big meeting, um, and then I think. Um, you know, we, we put together this initial framework or template as really just a starting point, and we didn't even really know how much, how much it would have sort of the salience with the group, and, and people really latched on to that and helped us refine it, and, and we hope get it to something that will be useful for the broader uh, DNI research community. So there's a couple of quick reactions. Any others from any of the other core members in terms of you know, reactions, especially those of you who have had the history of going to the larger meeting and the differences with the smaller meeting? I think for me, this is Borshika, um, understanding other people's work in more depth and being able to build on that, it was only possible because we had such a small group. And so we were able to um, identify very specific products that will emerge from this meeting, and we already made tremendous progress on those and this is the advantage over a larger meeting, I guess, although we heard over and over that people really enjoy the large meetings. And uh, so that was another piece where we were able to contrast now and uh, gather information about the value of the large meeting and uh, future planning opportunities. Laura Murray, your line is open. Great. Thank you, Carla. Please just start. Hi, this is Laura. Um, I'm with Johns Hopkins University. I'm very happy to be part of this. And I guess I'm, uh, I haven't been able to get the PowerPoint that you're all speaking off of, but we're very um, interested in the measurement dilemma. And um, as Ross knows, our team has gone back to a log frame to look at the constructs. And what we've developed over time is a qualitative and a, and a quantitative measure for four different levels. Um, for the consumers, the providers, the organization level, and the policy level. And I would say what our instruments do differently from the existing catalogs is they have quite a bit of um, breadth rather than depth. Um, so existing measures se seem to focus in on sort of, you know, something specific like organizational culture and climate. I just mention this because I think it would be very interesting to work um, more closely with some of you to send you the log frames that we've worked from, the existing measures that we're now running in two different countries. We do all global mental health. So as um, – I'm sorry, I, I missed your name, the last woman who spoke. When you really say utility across projects, across different contexts, and very usable, very short – that is exactly what we're, we're trying to do. So I would love your email contact to get um, feedback from you. Thank you. This is uh, very exciting, and I would love to uh, learn more about your work. Uh, I, we can send – I guess I don't know what the best way is, Margaret. Are we going to be able to provide a slide? And my email is on the slide. It, yes, and Laura, I just have – this is Margaret Farrell from MCI, and I just saw your email. We'll be happy – we'll be sending out copies of the slides um, to you, and that will have the contact information. And, Laura, you'll see on, on the um, the note that we'll be sending to all the participants today, uh, 
Gila already started the discussion on this topic on the Research to Reality Community of Practice. And, Laura, that may be a great place for you to post, you know, your um, your fig, either your your um, your discussion um, also, and, and get feedback about about your um, your figure, your project as well. So, um, thank you to both of you. We have a question thank from um, Marianne O'Brien who um, asks: In the future, if there is a set of DNI common measures, are there thoughts about mandating the use of the common measures? Being via a request for proposals process. You know that's a great question. I mean, the same could be said for reporting guidelines. And I think generally people have been very hesitant about mandating things. Um, but I, I think I think there may come a time when sort of recommended. I mean, the, the places I know of. So if you think of the grants that NIH does, you know, the investigator initiated things. Of course, they're not mandating things because the the, the ideas coming from the investigator. On the other hand, when you get to a number of grants from CDC or other federal agencies that are seen more as cooperative agreements, there are things, they don't call them mandates, but they call them, you know, common reporting guidelines or standardized reporting from all grantees. And then they do get to things that are, that are I think, pretty close to being mandated. So, you know, I think that um, it, the, the, the answer is the one we always use. It depends on the on the setting and the funder, but I do think there probably are some projects that are maybe more dissemination implementation of an evidence-based program, but not necessarily a strict investigator-initiated research project that may get closer to sort of the mandated role than than typically we've looked at in the in the research community. Great, thanks. We have another question from um, Kelly Kerner who asks, can you say more about the specific products that will be coming out of your work group near term? We can. Maybe Chris can talk about the specific products and then Borshiga as well because we have several sort of the scientific products as well as some more web-based applications. So, Chris, you mentioned these. Maybe you can line out. Yeah. So from the publication guideline standpoint, our, the first step and what we hope to have done by the end of calendar year 2014 is a review of all existing publication guidelines that Equator currently archives, both those in development and those that have already been published, with a specific eye towards which DNI domains they advocate measuring and reporting and which are absent from the framework that we've presented today. And we, again, we hope to do that in a systematic way and by contacting the authors of existing guidelines to see if there are in, in development measures that, that we aren't aware of yet. And we want to really highlight the deficiencies in the DNI research method reporting um, in what's reported today. After that, if we find that there are significant deficiencies and we're not going to be able to change every single publishing guideline to incorporate DNI principles, the next step would be to develop our own separate DNI publication guideline that does incorporate all the different uh, attributes and the domains that we've listed in our framework. And that would probably be a couple year process and that would be in collaboration with others around the world who have similar ideas. Um, but the first thing we want to do is highlight what, what the deficiencies are of what already exists. And then Borska, maybe you could say a bit about some of the products from the measures and evaluation part. Sure. There is a near-term uh, product of a publication where we will try to catalog existing efforts around synthesis and evaluation of DNI measures. That's where we will try to do a more comprehensive environmental scan of identifying these efforts similar to the CERC measures and the uh, GEM DNI effort and uh, describe them and perhaps contrast them, make recommendations on how people can use them best. And um, another effort that we will start very soon, actually, is a web-based resource that will build on the systematic review of DNI models by Rachel Tabak and colleagues, and we'll try to create a web-based uh, guidance on which DNI framework should be used in which, ca which case, and also link eventually those frameworks to measures. And that might be a little bit of a longer-term goal. And then the other product we'll have coming up, and, and Gila, maybe you can say a few words, but Gila will take the lead, and I put back up our, what we're calling our framework template logic model, and, and Gila is taking the lead on, on writing up this 
and then sort of summarizing what's going on there. And Gila, you want to say a little more about that? Yeah, this would be, um, yeah, we're working on a manuscript where we'll present this framework and describe and define each of the different aspects of the framework and as sort of a call to action that in terms of generating a set of guidelines around these issues, but really the focus is um, presenting a template or framework or um, logic model, whatever you want to call it, but something that would guide researchers on how to report their research so that end users, the policy makers, the decision makers, can most effectively interpret and use um, the information provided in the research. And um, we hope that this will be forthcoming as soon as possible. Great. Thank you, Gail. We have um, a call from um, Russ Glasgow who's having trouble getting his um, his mute to work. He thinks it's us on this end turning him off. But um, <laughs> maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> I will not disclose. But um, but Russ writes that um, it's exciting to see all the activities that are going on in terms of um, measurements. And um, another thing, and he says that he's trying to be a bit provocative, is that he did not hear anyone mention cost in capital letters and resources in terms of most important in moving this forward. Um, and Russ says he, he would think that that's the thing that's most needed. And, and so Russ can't explain that more, but so in terms of cost of, you know, developing a bank of measures, cost of developing measures, or cost embedded as one of the measures or one of the reporting elements. I'm not sure I follow exactly what the question was. I think just knowing what Russ usually um, mentions as we have discussions is certainly cost in terms of an outcome and okay. not necessarily the way we generally think about cost, but more intervention cost, replication cost. What does it cost to do this intervention in a different setting with a different, you know, set of players? So basically gathering information on that in a systematic way and thinking about those components he might have meant this time something else, but I know that this is something he definitely is passionate about. Yeah, I think that's really important both on the research side and if you get to the policy end, I mean, what what policy audiences, practice audiences will always ask about is the cost and do we know the cost, do we know the cost effectiveness, do we know the return on investment, so I think those are all very important. Great. Um, so I'd just like to, to end on, on this end by asking um, if Chris or Ross or Borska, if you have any um, final words to add to um, the, the discussion or, or any final thoughts, we will be um, inviting everyone um, in email to follow to continue the discussion online at Research to Reality, and a direct link to Gila's discussion on this has already begun and will be sent um, to you. So, um, any final thoughts from our speakers? I think that um, that we're viewing this as a starting discussion. So, I think part of it, as you see, is where the field is. It's still kind of in the early first generation of a lot of these things. So, I think part of it is staying tuned. I mean, back to Laura's question about measures. I think we're very much focused here on developed and sort of middle and higher income countries. So, there's a large gap still in a lot of this work and in lower and middle income settings and lower resource settings. So I think um, stay tuned. Um, there's a lot of work in this area to be done. We'll look forward to staying engaged with the, with the people on the line and, uh, and hopefully as we come back around, see many of you at the large NIH conference if it can get launched in the future. From the publication guidelines standpoint, I would encourage all the webinar uh, participants to look at what already exists on the equator network uh, and what's in development as well. And if you're aware of something that's out there that Equator's not aware of, that, that our group is not aware of because we didn't present it today, send me an email and, and let me know that you know that this exists and that there's direct relevance to DNI research reporting. And that'll keep us in the loop and make sure that we've done a better job searching for what is already out there. And then from the measurement perspective, uh, I already mentioned that most immediately we would love to learn about any other efforts of bringing together measures for DNI. So just like Laura mentioned, her existing work, please do contact me with information about that or any other emerging uh, research projects that might focus on measurement and uh, furthering this area. 
Great. And thank you all so very much. I think the hour completely flew by. And, um, again, we'd like to encourage you to um, continue this discussion today online. We hope to have the archive of today's um, program up by um, this time next week. And we're looking forward to our um, next advanced um, science webinars to be held in January.